So hi everyone, welcome back to That Fiction Life. Today I have a very special guest, Cassandra Clare, on to talk about some of her Shadowhunter books. Hi Cassie. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to have you. There are no spoilers for the majority of the video. There will be a warning 10 seconds before any spoilers with the below sign flashing over the mentioned book. Alternatively, all questions are listed in the description with the book that's being spoiled for easy skipping. I hope you enjoy the video. I have my books here. So this is your latest release. And so my first question would be for you to tell us a little bit about it, as well as which character from this book specifically surprised you the most when writing the book with Wesley. So the last book with the Y is a sequel to the Red Scrolls of Magic. They're all part of a series called The Eldest Curses, um, which focus on Magnus and Alec from the Mortal Instruments book. And Lost Book of the White was a lot of fun. It takes place in 2010, um, a few years after the events of Red Scrolls. And in it, they Magnus and Alec are visited at home by uh, a long lost friend who immediately steals Magnus's very precious copy of The Lost Book of the White and disappears with it. And they uh, must recruit their, the, the old team, uh, J.S. Clary, Simon, Isabel, and go to Shanghai to where uh, this person, this warlock, is, hanging, is hiding out <laughs> to retrieve the book. And of course, they're sucked into a big mystery and conflict involving, as usual, you know, demons, angels, good doers, evil doers, um, adventure, romance, all the, all the usual suspects. I would say that Alex surprised me the most at the end of this <laughs> book. He has a decision to make. He has to take a particular action and that action is very risky. Alec is someone I think of as being someone who is very brave, but not a wild risk taker. You know, Jason and Isabella are much more like, we're going to just jump and then we're going to land somewhere and we'll figure it out from there. And Alec is much more like, he wants to know the plan. You know, he wants to make sure they've made the right decisions before they enact something. At the end of the book, when the stakes are really high, he just jumps and does this very risky thing. I, it was interesting to me. I really felt like it was part of the, the, the evolution of, of his character. I definitely agree. Since I've read the book, I know exactly which <laughs> parts you are talking I'm trying about. trying not to be spoilery, so I'm just like, there is a thing that he does, but you know what I mean. I do. So my second question, you alluded to this a little bit, but there's a really substantial time jump, as you said, in the sequel. I was just wondering how you came to this decision. The Ellis Curse is a really interesting trilogy because I feel like it works structurally very differently from other trilogies I've written, which all of them, as far as I know, it proceed in chronological order. And there are no big time jumps. Um, you know, maybe a few weeks between books, but this is several years. The Ellis Curse is are a series of books in which we check in on Magnus and Alec during some of the big turning points in their lives. So the first book, Red Scrolls, follows them really right after they've sort of established their relationship mm -hmm. and follows them as they sort of define what it means to be together. And the second book takes place right after they've adopted a child. And to me, this was about Magnus and Alec figuring out what it meant to be parents and also to be part of this very dangerous magical world and to be engaged as they often are in trying to, in these sort of daring rescues and these adventures, you know, in trying to fight back the forces of evil, but to do so is dangerous. And so they have to confront what does it mean for us to put ourselves in danger when now we have this kid and how do we, you know, what adjustments and changes are we going to need to make to our lives and even to the way that the, that we think of ourselves. And so uh, I feel like, you know, we're going to jump in on Magnus and Alec at multiple sort of turning points in their relationship. My next question is about London because I am in London myself and oh, cool. my favorite series from you is The Infernal Devices. So I wanted to know, is there any particular fact about London that you remember? Because I know you said you lived here for a little while. Is there any strange fact about the city that you've written into the books that you remember? I mean, London is an amazing city, which has these incredible layers of history. I think one thing that appeared in the briefly in the Infernal Devices and sort of carries over into the last hours is the existence of the Devil Tavern on Fleet Street. Mm. So there's just a little, you know, the little blue plaques that you see on historical buildings in London that yeah. tell you like, you famous lived here or something happened here. So I remember I was um, on Fleet Street with my mom and I passed this, 
the, the little blue, there's a little blue plaque there um, where the Devil Tavern used to be. And I thought the Devil Tavern, what a great name. So I went and looked it up and found out that it had been this meeting place for all of these incredibly famous, you know, um, writers and historians and thinkers um, of London's sort of Renaissance period. And uh, Samuel Johnson in particular, and his Apollo Club, which was sort of his friends, and they would get together and drink, and they would talk about big ideas and and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And I just loved that it had been there. And I thought, well, one of the great things about writing, you know, fantasy is that you can imagine a world in which this place is still there in some form. So the Devil Tavern became, is, is briefly mentioned in the Infernal Devices that it still exists. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in Last Hours, it plays a bigger role as sort of the, the hangout of place course. for the for the merry thieves when they're not at home. So that was a really, that was a really fun thing. I love that detail, it's so cool. I love when they hang out there. Do we see that come up again in the next book? Oh yeah, yeah. it's like they're home away from home, you know, I mean, they That's have to go cool. somewhere where they can all hang out. And one of the things about the last hours is they all have these very nice parents. And I was like, yes. oh man, you know, like uh, we, we can't, they can't hang out at home because their parents would be like, what's up, what are you doing? How's everything going? So they need their own space. And exactly. I really love the Devil Tavern. It like the second, I think the second chapter of, of Chain of Iron is a big party at the Devil Tavern. It was really fun to write. Oh, I'm looking forward to that very much. My next question is linked to that a little bit and it's specifically about Matthew. And I was wondering in Chain of Iron, particularly how will we see his Parabatai bond with James change because of all his troubles and secrets? Poor Matthew. Um, he is definitely um, um, on the top tier of troubled characters of the last hours. He's got a mm -hmm. lot going on. And, and significantly what he has is this big secret that he's keeping um, about what he did in the past. For those of you who've read Ghost of the Shadow Under Academy, you know. For those of you who haven't, it does get explained in Jane of Iron. But um, he's, he's sort of holding on to this. And, he's, and I think that what's happening with James and Matthew's relationship is that they're both keeping secrets from each other. Matthew's keeping this, this big secret from James. He doesn't want to tell him because he doesn't want to lose James's good opinion. He doesn't want James to look at him differently than James does now. Um, but unfortunately, the keeping of that secret itself starts to change their relationship. And James is very aware that something's going on with Matthew, but he doesn't know what. And he's feeling that distance. And Matthew is aware that he's not you know, telling James everything. And so he is feeling that. I mean, it's the second book. Things, things tend not to get better in second books. They tend to get more <laughs> pressurized. <laughs> so, Maybe in the last one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That generally things resolve themselves in the last book for good or ill. And um, certainly we leave James and Matthew's relationship in a very uncertain place. Okay, good to know. I'm looking forward to the drama. <laughs> Arab row drama. <laughs> Looking at the series and chronicles as a whole, can you give us a weird piece of trivia or information about the world that didn't make it past the edits, but it's something that you still think about? It's London related, actually. Um, oh. well, uh, when I was uh, researching for Chain of Iron, mm -hmm. sorry, Chain of Arts, for Chain of Gold, um, mm -hmm. I did a lot of researching into plagues and epidemics, which I got to tell you is very, very disturbing right now. I wish I didn't know all the things that I knew. I hadn't spent like two years reading about, you know, epidemics that have devastated the world. Of course, I read about, you know, the cholera epidemics in London and also the Black Plague. And one of the things that I learned was that there are these plague pits full of bodies that are still under central London, you know, in a lot of residential neighborhoods. And people may be living on top of plague pits and they don't know it. Um, so uh, one of the scenes in the original version of Chain Bulb was set in Golden Square. So I don't know if you know where Golden Square is, oh, right, but yeah. it's right on top of an enormous plague pit. Right. Yeah, don't tell the people who live there. It's very disturbing. <laughs> and so there was this big scene that took place there. And because of the way the book worked, I had to move it um, to Highgate Cemetery. It just wasn't, wasn't working in central London. And I needed to be closer to uh, the silent city, but I still remember that. And there is actually a brief scene in, in Golden Square in Chain of Iron. But um, now when I'm in London, I'm sometimes I'm like, we're on walking on a plague pit. And my husband's like, could you not? <laughs> <laughs> it's so strange how research can take you to all these dark places that I think other people might look at you kind of, are you okay? What, why are you so excited about this? You know, Borough Market. Mm -hmm, yeah. Oh, I love Borough Market. And I was there, I was in London in January. It's the last place oh. I went really with my mother. 
um, cause I was doing, I was speaking at Oxford and so I wanted to come with me. Um, and so we went, I took her to Borough Market and then I was like, oh, I have one of my favorite places is near here. And I took her to this place. It's basically, there's nothing there but a fence with a lot of little letters and flowers and what's stuck in it. And I was like, this was the Crofts Keys graveyard. This was where they used to bury prostitutes and unbaptized babies. My mother was like, this is such not a thing I wanted to see. <laughs> I was like, this is so cool. Mom was like, why? Right is a weird, just accept it. I know, we have weird interests. It's just one of those things. You've said that authors shouldn't feel regret over killing their characters because it's necessary for the plot. <laughs> How do you feel that this is accomplished from a writing perspective and doesn't come across as just for shock value and that it's genuine? Well, I think you ask yourself two questions. Mm -hmm. You know, what does this mean in terms of the character's arc? You know, am I cutting off the character's arc before it's finished? Am I saying something about this character that I want to say or something I don't want to say about their death, that involves their death? Um, a lot of, I mean, most of the characters that I have in my career, I knew they were going to die. You know, I sort of created them to die. I knew that Sebastian was going to die. I knew that Jordan mm -hmm. was going to die. I knew that Max was going to die. And I knew that Libby was going to die. Um, and they were sort of created so as, as with that in mind as part of their purpose. So I think that's part of it. That doesn't mean that you're never going to kind of realize as a character that, that a character's death is necessary to further the story. But I do think it that for me, a lot of the times, not killing the character would kind of crumble the story because the, mm -hmm. their death has been worked into the story as a necessary occurrence that's going to make what happens next happen. Without Libby dying, there would be no Livia's watch. There would be no rebellion against the cohort. There might not be a realization of how bad the cohort really are. There would be no Ty and Kit relationship there would be you know no um Libby was sort of moving on to the next stage so without that I would have had a really hard time creating the rest of the story because it was always meant to be a part of it um I also think you have to ask yourself you know that one of the questions that, that writers always ask themselves will this make the story more or less interesting will make it more or less feel more or less significant and if the death of this character is going to make the story less interesting, you should really ask yourself whether that's something you want to do. But if you feel like it's going to raise the stakes and make the story more interesting, then you kind of have to do it. Who makes you the saddest that you've killed off? <laughs> oh, oh, that's tough. Um, I think it's probably a tie between Libby and Max, you know? I agree. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to a friend of mine when she was reading it and she got to the end and she started crying and she was like, I'm so angry with you, I can't talk to you anymore. And I was like, <laughs> I was listening to the Lord of Shadows audiobook, and right at the end, I was falling asleep because it was the end of the audiobook. And I thought, this is such a nice way to fall asleep. I'm just <laughs> going to play. And you know the moment as if you're, I'm just falling asleep and then your eyes suddenly pop open. I was, what? <laughs> Honestly, Cass, you ruined my night because I was so traumatized. I had someone bring the book to me and they opened it and they showed this one page and, you know, it was kind of stained and they're like, this is where I cried. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> the very scene. My copy of Clockwork Princess probably looks like that because the epilogue was something else. And, you know, people often ask me about that. And I, I mean, it was really sad writing, you know, the sort of the end of things and, and the death of Will, but mm -hmm. I didn't feel the same like sadness about it that I felt about Livy and Max, because Livy and Max, you know, they had their whole lives ahead of, of them. Of course, yeah. You no, know, they're, they're so young. It's so awful. Whereas Will, at least, you know, I felt like he'd had such a wonderful life. And that was something that was really mm -hmm. important to me. I think it was also the fact that you had Jem there with the violin and, you know, I think it was the atmosphere. Uh, Tess is immortal and Jem was nearly at that point immortal and to have them not, you know, have to have Will leave and them not be able to follow, I think is the great sadness there. You know, he departs and, you know, <laughs> our world and they know that it will be a long, long time before they ever see him again. Which plot in any of your books in the Chronicles was a spontaneous writing decision that you did not put in your outline? Simon losing his memory actually was not in the original oh, outline. Um, and I will tell you, the original outline was that Simon was going to die. And so that's one of those things where I went through the, the process of thinking, is this going to be better? Is this say about the character what I want it mm. to say? And I realized that it didn't. Because I felt like his death to me said, you know, you can't be 
a mundane who enters this shadow hunter mm -hmm. world and survives. Only special people can be in a part of it. Only if you're born to be a shadow hunter can you be a shadow hunter. And that wasn't what I wanted to say with the story. So I re-outlined and I altered it so that he would survive. But I did, I did the mean thing of taking his memories away because I knew there had to be, a, because the story contained the scene in which Simon sacrificed himself for his friends. So I knew that he would still have to make a sacrifice, but it wouldn't be his life. Wow. Yeah, I know. It would have been immensely sad. And I'm kind of relieved that I didn't have to write everybody's mm -hmm. incredibly crushed feelings because they're already sad enough that he, that as far as they can understand it in that time, they basically lost him. You know, he's still alive, mm -hmm. but he doesn't know them. He doesn't remember them. They can't drag him back into their world. And so they think we're never going to see him again. So there is that sense of loss, but it is not. But what I, I had Magnus kind of come along and he basically makes this speech that I made to myself, which was like, we're not going to let this happen. You know, this is not, this is not the way your story ends, Simon. You know, you're too, you're good, too good of a person for that. And you've done too much. Definitely been very, very glad that I didn't kill him. Aside from the fact that several of my friends would probably have killed me. But uh, <laughs> I, I think I did feel, you know, you ask yourself that question, will this make things more interesting or less interesting? And I thought, you know what, less interesting. Well, you know, these stories are more interesting with Simon in them. Now for my final question is about the sword catcher. How did you approach writing a new genre and were there any challenges that you did not anticipate? Well, I'm still writing it. I'm here working mm -hmm. on it right now. But yeah, I mean, it is a new genre for me um, in terms of high fantasy because what I've written before is what we call contemporary fantasy. Mm -hmm. And so to what I'm used to is, you know, taking a, creating a fantasy world and layering on, on top of our world. And, uh, Instead, with Swordcatcher, this is a completely secondary world, so it's sort of invented from the ground up. Um, and it, it does present definitely different challenges. When I'm writing, you know, Mortal Instruments, I can say, well, we're in New York, or, you know, Infernal Devices, we're in London, and people, people are familiar, they know what that means, and there's a lot of sort of inherent knowledge there. I don't have to sort of describe the entire history of New York or London to explain mm -hmm. to you, you know, this is a large city with a lot of people living in it, and here's where we are in history. You know, um, this is all knowledge that, that fortunately you can assume your audience already has. Whereas if I say we're in Castellane, which is the place that uh, Swordcatcher is set, that doesn't mean anything, right? I have to build this world from the ground up. And sometimes that means fun stuff, you know, figuring out how the royal family works, where this, the, the, the place is situated, the different kinds of people that live there. Sometimes you're literally sitting there looking up the history of lamps so that you can create, you know, a realistic feeling background you sort of layer your story on top of. So it's an enormous amount of research. Did different kind of research than the research I've done before, which is all about taking, you know, um, history that we're familiar with and blending it with the shadow hunters. And now this is completely creating something out of nothing. And in some ways it's fun to be able to create all your own rules in other ways, you know, there's a real responsibility there to create something that feels real because if that world doesn't feel real, you're not gonna believe anything that happens in it. So that's definitely been, been, been a big uh, challenge, but it's also fun, you know, like to create your own world. So I would say it's a, it's a mixture. Sometimes I'm sitting there, you know, reading the history of gardens through the ages and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> textile, trade, currency, all of the stuff. Yes. Um, also different languages, you know, um, had to create three different languages. And so I'm sitting here with dictionaries for very obscure languages in that exist in our world so that I can kind of look at their structures and how they work and build a new language off of that. And all of that is stuff I've never, you know, had to do before. Mm. So it's a fun challenge, but it is a big challenge. And then also just to write characters who are completely different age than I'm used to writing. These characters are in their 20s. They've got jobs. They've got <laughs> careers. They're not um, really, they don't relate to their family structure in the same way that you do when you're a teenager. So it's definitely interesting to, to kind of come at things from, from that angle. Did you always intend to go straight to high fantasy in the adult genre after the Shadowhunters Chronicles? No, I was traveling with my husband through Southeast Asia and I was sort of writing down different ideas. Um, like I get most a lot of ideas when I'm traveling and thinking about different possibilities for stories I might want to tell. And I suddenly got this idea. I've heard people call them plot bunnies, like, you know, the little rabbits hopping around <laughs> in your head. But <laughs> to me, it was more like something stuck itself into my brain and I couldn't get it out. So I wound up writing it all down. And then once I had written it all down, um, I sent it off to my agent and he was like, this is 
this is the proposal for a whole book. Do you want to like do this? And I was like, I kind of do. I just felt compelled to write it. And I think mm -hmm. that, you know, one of my problems is falling in love with ideas and then having a million books I want to write all at the same time. Yes. So I'm trying to be a little bit better with my schedule and uh, kind of write one book at a time instead of two or three books at a time. Yes. And definitely Swordcatcher is, is going to be a big book, but it is a lot of fun and contains a lot of things I really love from secret identities, giant crocodiles, um, you know, all that good stuff. So that Swordcatcher will come out before the final volumes of the Shadowhunters books, which okay. are the Wicked Powers. So we'll have Swordcatcher mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to kind of hopefully say goodbye to the Shadowhunter world. Although you never know. I know I've decided never yes. say never because if I get an idea and I feel like I have to write it, then I'm going to have to write it. Those are all my questions. Thank you so, so much to Cassie for talking to me today. It was lovely to talk to you.